to yet another great life cast video. Before we get into this one, I need you to do a couple things for me. If you haven't already, go down, subscribe to the official life cast page. Also, go right over, hit that little notification bell so you get the notifications when we drop all the latest content right away. Last but not least, let's participate in this video. Give me that thumbs up or that thumbs down, depending on what you like. Send some comments over, share the video, bring the friends and family. We're here to light your fire eternally, enhance the human experience. Welcome to LifeCast. Start by talking a little bit more about LifeCast. Now, life cast is basically what the name says. Life cast as in broadcasting life. Um, what I wanted to do with this life cast is I wanted to set up basically a series of resources, right? And maybe even a protocol, if you will, or some principles um, that I have really, really found helped me through a lot of great stuff. Ren, Melissa, what's up? Welcome. How are we doing? Thanks for coming in. Um, so I've spent the last year of my life really um, trying to hone down and kind of tie in these principles. I've gone through a lot of change. It's been a really, really hard year, honestly, on a number of levels. Um, but like so many things that are hard, you know, we come out kind of towards the back end of it and there's a lot of beauty there. One of, one of the most beautiful things about the hard times um, that I've gone through here recently over the last year was that it did birth this whole entire um, system, this whole movement. Um, and that's really what I want it to be as a movement. Um, I am a little bit disheartened with all the things I see fitness, wellness related online. There's a ton of it. And um, I feel like there's a whole heck of a lot of stuff that I'm not super crazy about. And I feel like we're providing people um, with some less than stellar information. Um, and I really just kind of wanted to change the perspective a little bit um, and offer kind of how I see um, things going and really look at it from the human experience point. Okay, that's one thing that you'll kind of hear me saying a lot is the human experience because I do believe that life is really an experience, uh, especially if you're doing it right where you want to experience it the highs, lows, ups, downs, ebbs, and flows, um, all that thing. So, my whole philosophy with this thing is to enhance the human experience. Now, I spelled life in the life cast L Y F E for a reason. Um, stands for light your fire eternally. And I guess that, you know, um, is, is a goal is to kind of get that inner motivation, that, that inner self, the true you to start um, raging and to start just um, burning, burning hot and really um, 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 being excited and, and achieving success. So ultimately what I've come up with are um, the principle of the three flames. And the three flames are the body, the mind, and the soul. Um, or the spirit, however you want to look at it. But I fully believe that as um, we travel through this human experience and we're going through things, that is what we are. We are a combination of body, mind, and soul, right? Um, and it's really important to have each of these flames running and burning um, in control, but burning at maximum level. And when each flame comes together, right, and we get this blazing inferno, that's where we start to see some of the true magic in life happen, consciousness, um, true happiness, success, really being able to do anything and everything that you want um, to be able to do. Now, um, as a, or on LifeCast, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have a couple really awesome things going on. I'm gonna do lives like this. Um, every week on Monday, I'll be going live. Um, we're gonna start it here on Facebook. I'm gonna be unveiling a new principle every Monday. Um, and then posting videos throughout the week that have to deal with that principle. Uh, so I'm super stoked about that. Um, as well as I am doing a video podcast. It is called the life cast. It's the, it's the, the flagship thing that we're doing. Um, but I'm going to bring someone in at the end of every week to sit, have a real life conversation. Um, we'll start by kind of talking about um, the, uh, the principle of that week. And we're just going to kind of let it go. And we're going to talk about real raw stuff. Excuse me. Uh, I'm kind of getting over a little bit of a cold here. So for, for, forgive me if I kind of um, do a couple of those things. Um, what we're not going to try to do is be the typical like rah rah motivational woohoo you can do anything and because that's fine and there's a place for that and motivation's good and but we have a lot of stuff like that out there and so I'm really hoping to kind of come with a more raw more real um, and talk about real life and so the most important thing that kind of segues into this and then I'll get into it um, is 
everyone here, it's your feedback, it's your participation in this. Um, that is how I want this whole entire movement to be driven, right? I'm gonna present some stuff. Everything I present will be principle-based. There's nothing set in stone. There's nothing that says it has to be done like this. But rather, I want to teach principle and hopefully um, the principles, I've designed them and hopefully it works that they're liquid and they're fluid enough to where you can mold them and make them fit to your life because that's like where the success is gonna happen. If I'm just up here yapping about what makes me successful, yeah, well that's all well and good but we need to learn how to apply it into each other's lives. Um, so ultimately, I want this to be driven by you. I need comments, I need participation, I need you to like this stuff or dislike it, share it, get your friends on board, get your family on board, go um, uh, subscribe to all the different social medias. I'm gonna put all those links in the description when I actually post this. Um, again, I need you, your help to help drive this thing, to help get it to the masses because I believe in this wholeheartedly with all my heart and soul because it has changed my life um, exponentially. And I really want to share these things. And so I'm really happy. I'm really excited. Lots of momentum. Um, I think that's probably enough rambling about that. And I think we'll kind of get into the first principle here. All right. So the first thing that I want to talk about and the first principle that I have um, kind of outlined in, in, in um, the principles of the three flames is... That's my special effect. It's emotional intelligence. Do me a favor, if you've ever heard of emotional intelligence, drop me some thumbs up in the comments, give me a little emoji, Let's get a little participation. If you've heard of emotional intelligence, go ahead and uh, uh, interact here with me. Awesome, very cool. Um, so emotional intelligence, really, really cool stuff. Um, I think some of us have heard it. I'm not sure if people have tried to Im um, implement it in their life or are aware of how it fits in their life, um, but hopefully I can kind of shed a little bit of light today on what is emotional intelligence? Why is it really important? Um, and is it, are we able to develop it? Is it something that we're born, born with? Um, those kind of things, okay? So, um, I think before we get into emotional intelligence though, it warrants us talking about emotions a little bit, right? And we'll kind of start there and kind of segue as we continue to, to kind of go through this process. So, emotions. Electrochemical signals, and I'm going to read this, in our brains that are based upon experiences and perceptions of our surroundings, right? So in other words, emotions are kind of the way that our body, a way that our body can communicate to us all the different experiences that, we're, that are coming and going into our lives, right? It is a very real way when something happens, something is triggered, an electrochemical response, it brings on certain feelings, physical um, mental, um, spiritual, right? And that is kind of what an emotion is. Simple. It's simply that. It is a tangible thing um, that we can actually measure uh, with science right now, which is super cool. So at the basis, that's what an emotion is. Now, depending on like what you read or who you're talking to, um, there are basic human emotions. People say anywhere from six to nine of them. Um, through all my readings and the things that I like, I kind of picked out eight that I really hit home for me. Um, and as we go through this, again, I'm gonna emphasize it that just because these would be my eight doesn't mean that they're your eight. And that being said, you may have things that, you know, other people and experts and all these things, uh, they just don't have. Um, so it is extremely important um, that you take this and make it yours, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right, so my list, joy, sadness, love, fear, disgust, surprise, contempt, and anger. Now, if you have any other emotions, throw them in the comments right now. Again, I wanna hear about what you guys think. But that's a pretty basic list, I feel like. I feel like that um, most of us would agree that you know at least some of those are on our list of emotions. And those are things, if not, if you don't call them emotions, I'd be willing to bet you at least deal with some of them um, every day um, or you know at least somewhat regularly. So those are the kind of lists of emotions. Now, as we go through this, I want to make it very, very clear that um, there's no such thing as good and bad emotions, right? Emotions are neutral in and of themselves. 
Um, emotions come and they go. The chemical react, um, that starts in the hypothalamus, which uh, uh, regulates our endocrine system, right? The chemicals then translate and we come up in through the limbic system and as it makes its way up into our rational brain, up into the front of our, um, front of our brain up here, right? That's kind of the, the, the whole spectrum of how emotion starts as a chemical, becomes something tangible, travels, and then we start to think about it and start to use it. Um, and I know that sounds super scientific and all. No, I'm just kidding. But that's basically what's going on, right? What's super interesting about emotions, they've been able now to kind of measure emotions and the physiology that goes along with it. And from the time that that emotion starts there in the hypothalamus, um, that, <clears throat> that very first uh, chemical signal, to the time it would all transfer all the way up and then eventually fade out, would only be about six seconds or so, right? Some say six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, not very long. The emotion itself is very short lived. Um, I think that this is extremely important. And this is important because anything that kind of comes after that, uh, a strong emotional feeling that's coming after that first six to ten seconds, that's our psyche taking over and that's kind of our ego kicking in and running with it, okay? And then this is where we can really start to get in trouble, I would say, right? Where all of a sudden we are now um, in an emotional state, potentially a high emotional state. We want to really try to avoid these high emotional extremes. Um, and when we do get in these kind of emotional, um, high emotional states, emotional extremes, we want to try to make sure that we're not um, making decisions or um, creating or uh, participating in any kind of bad behaviors that are only going to um, detract from the human experience and rather than enhance it um, because that is the most important part um, of the whole thing again is we're trying to enhance that human experience right and if we're not doing that then we're taking away from it and um, that's no good so you know emotions are super important happiness or joy is not better than anger or sadness um, or vice versa right they're all extremely important they're all extremely necessary and it's really important that we understand that concept that each of these emotions has a purpose um, and that as we can kind of learn to deal with them, learn to understand them, learn to appreciate them for what they are um, and actually learn to use them as tools to become better, to improve our lives, um, then that can really change the whole perspective on a lot of things in life. And so I guess that kind of segues into, well, how do we... You know, what is this control of the emotions that you're talking about? And I guess the question next would be, what is emotional intelligence? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So we can get a really fancy definition of emotional intelligence, which is the capacity uh, to be aware and to control and express one's emotions um, and to handle interpersonal relationships fairly and empathetically. Um, or we could kind of break it down to a little more, a little simpler. It's being learn, being able to identify, um, feel, right, appreciate your emotions, listen to them, but keep them under control, keep them going in the positive direction, as well as being able to um, emphasize or uh, to appreciate where others are coming from, right, to understand what others, um, what others' um, emotions may be, um, and those are really the two kind of sides of emotional intelligence. It's you know, appreciating, feeling, regulating your um, emotions, your emotional states based on everything that's going on and then anyone else that you're going to interact with and have to deal with being able to take on um, in a healthy way the stuff that they're projecting on, onto you and the things that they're going through. And so these are the two kind of main components of what emotional intelligence <clears throat> truly, truly is. Um, I truly believe that having a high level of emotional intelligence, intelligence it's one of like the most important things to success in life um, on a number and number of levels. And I guess, um, you know, one of the biggest ways we can kind of think of it is that <clears throat> everything we do is behavior, no matter what it is. You watching me now, me sitting here telling you this now and everything in between, everything you've done is behavior, right? Um, and often our emotions... Um, guide our behaviors, right? And so this can be an okay thing, but it can also be where we get into a heck of a lot of trouble and we want to get it to a point where our emotions aren't guiding our behaviors um, and that while we're experiencing our emotions and feeling them, um, we can learn to appreciate them for what they are, 
bring ourselves back to a more emotionally neutral state and then go on um, making any kind of decision or engaging in um, any kind of behavior. And this goes for all emotions across the board. <clears throat> um, let's see here as we keep going. So emotional intelligence is kind of broken down in the four components. Actually, you know what? Let me back up for just one second here. There's a guy named Daniel Goldman. Anyone ever heard of Daniel Goldman? He is an awesome author. He's written a lot of books. Um, he's one of the foremost experts on emotional intelligence. Um, I've read a couple of his books. Very, very good. Very awesome books here. I'll give him a little plug. Um, he has an article in this book. Highly recommend taking a look at this book. And then we do have another one. I'll show it to you if I can pull it up real quick because I want you to have the visual. Let's see here. Can you see? It's called Emotional Intelligence. Boom, just like that. Okay, so if you haven't checked those books out, highly recommend those. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, um, Dan's really cool because a long time ago, well not that long ago, but he, he conducted one of the biggest and the best um, research studies on emotional intelligence. And this was about emotional intelligence in the workplace, actually. So he and his group of researchers, basically, they gathered a bunch of data uh, um, from employee um, performance reviews, if you will, right? Companies, they come through, they hire these other companies to come through and give performance reviews based on X, Y, Z criteria. Um, that helps the company then, you know, steer their direction on, you know, where they want to go, the future, certain things like that. So it's a very common practice. So Dan and his team did something super awesome. They gathered a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of material, a bunch of studies, a bunch of this data, right? They gathered this data and then they did a meta-analysis of it. Or um, another word for meta-analysis is they basically just reviewed it um, and kind of put it into um, a little bit different context. And so what they wanted to kind of um, figure out ultimately is um, what were the biggest kind of most important skills to determining success, um, to determining um, you know, a successful leader, um, successful workers, that kind of thing. So he basically decided, he and his team decided to break, um, they would look at all the data of all these individual people. And based on that data, they would place them into one of three categories, right? It would be, oh, excuse me, now I got the hiccups a little bit. Um, the first category is going to be very technical, a lot of technical skills, analytics, putting things in business plan, um, those kind of things, right? The second part of it was kind of more of an IQ or a cognitive-based um, group here. And then the third part about, or, um, in, that, in, that, in that group was very good at reasoning, logical reasoning, those kind of things. And then the third group were people who are high in emotional intelligence. Um, who showed the ability to work well with others um, and have had effect, had effective, excuse me, effectiveness in leading um, change and rolling with things like that. So after they kind of compiled all this data and placed all these people into um, different groups, they had some really crazy um, findings and I'm gonna tell you just a couple of them that really stood out to me. Okay, so of the people who they identified as top performers, right, the people who at whatever job they were doing were seemed to be doing the best, the most productive, having the most success, um, of those top performers, 80 to 90% of them had um, above average levels of EQ or emotional intelligence. Um, you all often hear people refer to it as EQ or sometimes EI. Um, so you may hear me say EI or EQ um, inter interchangeably. That's just me referring to um, emotional in intelligence. Um, so that was one key fact. Of all the best uh, people, 80 to 90% of those up there had a high amount of emotional intelligence. Very telling. On the other side of that, of the people who they identified as like lower performers, maybe people who are just getting by above average, right below average, um, they found that only 20% of those people had high levels of emotional intelligence, meaning that 80% of them had um, less than average emotional intelligence. I don't know, to me that, that was huge. That was really, really interesting to see that, hey man, if on both ends of this, it's matching up, right? And the kind of the final thing uh, in, in that data when you're, when you're looking at it very easy um, is that uh, EQ, right, emotional intelligence, actually turned out to be 
twice as important to success um, and achieving in business um, as the other two were. And I thought that was fascinating, right? It's not the smartest person in the room. It's not the person who, you know, can necessarily focus the most, uh, the most at the task. No, it's the person who has the higher level of emotional intelligence who seems to get the job done and seems to be the best. Um, so for me, that was super telling, right? And if that's that, if it's like that in the workplace, it, it's going to translate that, translate like that to real life, absolutely. And. When you start looking at the people who you um, are having success, right, who are the happiest in life or, you know, those kind of people, it matches right up. Um, a lot of the other research, 80 to 90% of them have high levels of emotional intelligence. Um, so I found that fascinating and that's one of the reasons why I put this as my number one um, principle was because I feel like emotional intelligence is the most important thing um, that, that we can kind of develop on so many levels and it's a skill. And that's something that um, my goal is to try to kind of teach you a little bit more about that. All right, so um, as we move on, emotional intelligence is kind of broken down into four separate components by many expert, experts, inclu including um, uh, Dan Goldman here. Those are self-awareness, self-management, empathy, and social skills. All right, let's kind of go back and let's start over at self-awareness, okay? So self-awareness is the first part and that's really the ability to recognize and understand your moods, your emotions, um, what drives you, um, as well as their effect on you and on others, right? That is that, let's take a look and see what I'm doing. Let's see um, what I'm doing that's awesome, that's really benefiting my relationships, that's in, um, increasing productivity, that's making me happier. And then let's look at the other stuff as well. What am I not doing great at? What could I be better at? What is getting in the way of some of my relationships? What is getting in the way of some of my success? That is super duper important to be able to have that real deal, legitimate conversation with yourself. Because um, that's where it starts. If you can't have that, you know, that's the starting point, I guess I'm trying to say. It's super important to kind of start with that self-awareness. Um, People who are self-aware tend to be, have more self-confidence. Um, they're really good at giving realistic assessments of a given situation and then deciding how to handle those appropriately. Um, and also kind of have a self-deprecating sense of humor or they've not taken themselves um, too entirely serious. Um, and that is also shown to, um, to, to uh, provide benefits as well. What can we do to become a little more self-aware? So I have a couple of things that I think we can do. Um, and the first one again is look at yourself honestly or honestly, realistically, um, and have that little inner dialogue with yourself, right? Don't be afraid to talk to yourself. I talk to myself all the time. We all talk to ourselves all the time. I just do it out loud in public. <laughs> um, anyways, but ask yourself that, right? Sit there realistically and honestly, sit there with yourself and see what you're great at, what you can improve at, things that make you feel good, the things that don't, and become aware of those, and become aware of the sensations that you get when you think about the things you're doing well, what do you feel? When you think about the things that ah, maybe I wanna be better at, what are you feeling, right? So that's the first thing. Um, you know, the, the, the next thing I like is speak accurately and speak open. Um, about your emotions and your feelings. And this is so hard. This is one of the hardest things for us to do. Especially, um, I feel like as men, we're very much taught that men don't talk about their emotions, um, that, <clears throat> that we keep that stuff um, you know, bothered in. And I'm not saying it's just for men, but that's kind of one thing that is ingrained um, in men often is that we don't talk about our emotions. And a lot of people um, either are afraid to talk about their emotions or don't have um, you know, the skills to talk about their emotions um, and just don't understand. So ways that we can work on this is, you know, be amongst people you trust and love first and slowly but surely start to open up to them about your emotions, right? We have to be able to do these things in order to get practice, in order to change literally not only the circuitry in the brain, but the physical makeup. We're going to change the brain, how it's made. Um, Anyways, so speak accurately, be open and aware of those feelings and learn um, that it's okay to talk about them and to get them out there. Um, another thing that I highly recommend, and this is hard, but open yourself up to constructive criticism, 
Um, God, this is a really, really hard one, but it is so, so important because as awesome as you are at picking out all the stuff and identifying all the stuff, someone with a little bit different view um, can provide invaluable information that can really help you enhance yourself, um, become a better person, and really enhance your, your human experience. Um, so I, oh, I um, implore you or I, I, I um, encourage you to, you know what, let people, encourage people to give you self-constructive um, criticism, things that, the, that um, you, know, you can improve on, that they can help you, because that's only going to help your other relationships. Um, it's not an easy thing, but start with people who you know and that you love and that you trust. People you, who you know aren't going to set you wrong. People who know that um, you have their absolute best interests and they have your best interests in, uh, in hand and start there in a nice safe place. But as you begin to learn how to do this like anything, you then can take it, take it further um, and open up um, to others. Um, and then the last kind of part about this of becoming self-aware, and you'll see these all kind of um, you know, run together a little bit, but it's don't be afraid to talk about your limitations um, or your strengths for that matter. Um, you know, we have a hard time talking about both of those really, but don't be afraid of it because we are all strong and we all have limitations and that is part of the human experience. If you didn't, you wouldn't be human and we wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to acknowledge and be like, yeah, I kick ass at this. That's cool. Love it. Use that. Keep kicking ass at it. At the same time, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what? I need a little bit of work on this. Um, I could stand to be better in this area. And man, when you identify that, then you're right there on your pursuit to greatness, to being great. And ultimately, I think that that's the, the overlying thing is we're trying to live our best lives. We're trying to be great, achieve the success um, all, all over the board. So those are some ways that we can kind of become a little more self-aware. The next part of um, the next part or the next component of um, emotional intelligence is self-management or self-regulation. And now this is like the next step from self-awareness, right? And this is the ability to control or redirect impulses and moods. Um, it's the propensity to suspend judgment and to think before you act, really. And so this builds directly off that self-awareness because it's awesome. We can become as self-aware as we want and really do these things, but confront the ego. I just saw that, Ren. Holler. Um, but, if, uh, but if we're not able to regulate and manage ourselves and actually learn how to deal with the things that we identify above, um, then again, our um, ability and our capability, capacity for developing emotional intelligence will be hindered um, and thus our, you know, our human experience, um, we won't be um, enhancing to it. We could be potentially det uh, detracting from it. Um, so there's some hallmarks of people who are good at self-management and are good at self-regulation, um, often very trustworthy with high amounts of integrity. Um, your comfort with ambiguity, meaning that you don't always have to know the exact thing or have the exact answer at that time. Um, that's a skill, right? To be comfortable with that. So much, I mean, the unknown kills us all, right? We, we really want to know what's going on and have the next solution. But we have to understand that that's not always a good thing. And in fact, sometimes having that ambiguity is right where we need to be. And to accept that ambiguity um, is a real skill. And that's something that comes as you kind of get in better at self-management and self-regulation. Um, and then I, another hallmark is an openness to change. That's going to be a huge thing in life, right? Life is not static. It is constantly evolving up, down, left, right. It is fluid. Um, it changes from one second to the next. Um, and if you don't have the ability to kind of roll with those punches to accept the things that come with the change and still thrive and still um, succeed, then again, you're going to be hindered in your um, human experience. And that's exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do. So some things we can do to try to become uh, better at self-managing ourselves or self-regulating. Um, find ways that you can identify specifically um, and then control your emotions. It's going to be different for everybody, right? But it's going to be really important through this process to try to find a way that works for you where you can identify an emotion and a potential behavior coming and nip it in the bud um, before something happens and you're in too much of an emotional state um, or something like that and something bad happens, right? So that's one. Um, try to channel your emotions constructively. Um, do not let the ego take control, right? Like we said, an emotion is just an emotion, it's neutral. The ego grabs and runs 
that becomes really, really hard for us, the self, to reel it back in, drop the ego off, and um, do something constructive with that energy. We can practice techniques so, um, of you know feeling those emotions and then finding a way to redirect that energy into something positive and productive. We start becoming better at self-regulation and self-management. Um, also, big thing, <coughs> excuse me, um, create trusting and fair environments for those, uh, for yourself and for all those around you. If you can start to work on creating an environment that's healthy that people want to be in, that people want to interact with you in, um, you can bring more people, like-minded people, hopefully working on these same kind of things together. Um, it actually really helps you manage and regulate yourself because you're not going to have you know, you can control the, some of the stimulus and the input that is uh, brought in, right? One of the things you can control are the people that you kind of surround yourself with. So put yourself in good, in good places that are fair, um, that are loving, that are productive, that are positive, and that's only going to help you be able to kind of self-manage and self-regulate. Um, and then having those, you know, people around you who um, are, are, are willing to kind of let you know in a really constructive way, hey, buddy. Um, you know, maybe we could work on this next time. Or when you told me, when you reacted like this, this is how I felt. What if it went like this? Um, so having good people around you like that can really, really help with that. Um, and then the last thing, kind of as far as how we can become better at self-management and regulation, again, is embrace the change. Um, it's going to happen, whether it's at work, home, school, um, you name it. Change is coming, right? So embrace it, roll with it, learn it, understand it, and love it. Um, so those are a few ways that we can kind of get better at self-management and self-regulation. All right, moving on, next one. Next component of emotional intelligence is empathy. When we say the word empathy, <clears throat> at least for me, I always thought it was like, oh, well, I've walked in your shoes so I can feel what you're feeling. And while that could be part of it, that's not exactly what empathy is. Um, empathy truly is the ability to understand the emotional makeup <clears throat> of other people and then treating them accordingly, basically, um, and treating them according to their emotional reactions. And so this is so important when we start dealing with other people, especially, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because people, whatever someone else is going through, if you, be, if you come in contact with them, that's going to come to you. Now, when we take on other people's energy and other people's emotions, that's a scientific thing, right? We have things called uh, mirror neurons. And when we see someone smile, we smile. When we see someone frown, we frown. And that's kind of how it works. So people's energy, the way that they approach us has a huge impact on our behavior, on our emotions, and on how we react, right? That being said, it's so important to be able to develop that ability to say, hey, when my boss comes at me yelling, screaming, um, I'm not going to respond with yelling, screaming right back at him, right? Because even though he's bringing that on to me and he may be lacking in some of these other categories of emotional intelligence, I have enough empathy to say, you know what? I realize what's going on in his personal life right now. Or, you know, I saw something like this happen. Whatever it is, something that we can deal with to say, hey, you know what, I can't say that I've been there exactly, but I can empathize with you because you know what, I know that you're trying to do the best you can with what you have based on everything that's thrown at you too, right? Um, and so being empathetic is super important um, throughout life, but especially in developing um, a high level of emotional intelligence and then dealing with other people. Um, people who are empathetic, um, you know, they tend to emphasize building relationships, building teams. Um, they have a great deal of cross-cultural sensitivity, um, and they just want to be of service to others and be the giver. Um, and I think that those are all really, really incredible things, things that if we all practice continually, um, will make our levels of empathy um, go up, thus, you know, helping increase our levels of emotional intelligence. Um, let's see, what, what can we do? To kind of become a little more empathetic. Um, it's first and foremost just trying to understand others' viewpoints rather than jump to the most negative or the most emotional reaction possible. Um, see if you can't understand kind of where they're coming from first, um, especially before you have conversations and make decisions. Um, <clears throat> secondly, 
Um, you know, understand um, that cultural differences and ethnic differences um, are real big parts of life. And we all have them, right? Whether it's where you're from, your skin color, um, sexual orientation, who you vote for. I mean, name the list of things that, you know, subgroups that we could all potentially identify as part of. And we're going to see that they're not always going to match, right? And that's the beautiful thing. If we can start spending more time with people unlike us, it then allows our brains, literally reshapes the brains, changes the structure, changes the physiology to becoming more empathetic, having more um, love and respect for people who do things differently than you, right? Um, Because I promise you, my way is not the only way. I promise you that, right? Nobody's way is the only way. And if you think that, then you need to go back and start doing some of this emotional intelligence work again, right? You need to be pay attention to my system. But our ways are not the only way. And we can't think like they are. When we do, we stop that growth mindset, right? And we just get into like this closed mind state. And I think it's pretty evident how, you know, in much of today's landscape across the world really that we're really lacking in a component of empathy um, for people who are different than us Um, and I think that if we find people who um, are good people and we sit and just uh, you know take a step back and listen and observe um, you'd be surprised what you've learned you'd be surprised how much empathy um, you'll gain for them and for others so get out and meet people that uh that you know develop relationships with people that aren't like you super important all right let's see here Um, And then the last part, um, as far as uh, some things we can do to help create empathy, it's listen, open up those ears right here. These guys, we got two of them, only one mouth. Um, One thing I am working so hard on is listening. Man, oh man, from those of you who know me, I like to talk, 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 talk all the time. Um, And I'm really working on shutting this one mouth and opening up these two ears. Um, And that has actually paid great dividends and had great benefits for me. Um, so that's another way to uh, attain empathy is just shut the F up and listen um, because a lot of people have a lot of great things to say um, and great things to show you. All right. The last component of emotional intelligence kind of, kinds of brings, kinds of brings them, it kind of brings them all together. It's social skill. At the end of the day, social skill, you can define it as the proficiency in managing relationships and building networks. Um, the ability to find common ground and develop rapport. But ultimately, I look, at it, I look at it as like the culmination of the other three and what brings it together. Why? We can be as self-aware as we want to be and we can do all the right things, ask ourselves all the right questions, identify all the good and all the bad, right? We can do that. And even from there, we can develop ways to regulate that, right? We can develop ways to say, ooh, I'm feeling that emotion of anger. Why am I feeling that? What's going on? What do I need to do to try to um, appreciate this and then let it go and move on, right? We can develop these, these methods. Awesome, so we can do that. Empathy, we can continue to develop empathy on um, doing some of the things that we talked about. Um, but the thing is, if you don't have the social skill to bring it all together into a real world interaction, and a lot of times all that stuff is for naught. Um, And I don't want to say for not, but it it, it makes it a lot more difficult when interacting with people to kind of um, get that stuff across if you just aren't comfortable in social settings for whatever reason. And so, you know, that's not saying that you have, everyone's going to be an an extrovert and uh, that we're always going to be talking and we always have to develop these relationships and have a ton of friends and all this kind of thing. That's not really what that's saying at all. Um, But what it is saying, in my opinion, is that... um, Develop relationships, put an emphasis on it. Um, get around good people who you're comfortable talking to and they're comfortable um, opening up to you. People you're comfortable listening to and who are comfortable listening to you, right? Start there with all of this stuff. As you go and you start to interact with other people who you may not be on that desired level of comfort as you are a family member or a spouse um, or a dog. Um, but as you get into these other relationships that it's very important that we develop and cultivate, we can take those skills, um, those social skills, and then implement them there, implement them there. Um, and so it's just about developing a way that you can honestly open yourself up to um, communicating well with others 
and then um, having them open up to communicating well with you. Um, and working on those skills is really, really um, important. Um, a couple things that we can do um, um, to do it is, like I said, make friends, but have a purpose in the conversations, right? Um, the purpose doesn't mean you're necessarily trying to get something or manipulate, but have a purpose, right? Maybe my purpose is I'm talking to my best friend um, about you know the, the Bronco game and that I want to get his thoughts of that, and that's, so that's my purpose. Maybe my purpose is um, I'm at work, and I've recently met somebody at my lunch break who we have a business that could you know, really work well together and we could provide value to each other professionally. So we then set up a relationship, but the goal of the relationship is, right, a little more professional. Hey, we have some things that we can come together and everybody um, can succeed and win. And so that's kind of what I mean by have a purpose with developing the relationships. Um, and once you have that purpose, you actually be able to apply having purpose in everything you do in life. And that actually makes all of these principles that much, um, uh, that much more effective and easier to apply. Um, okay, so those are just a couple of, the, those are the four components. Um, last kind of thing I wanna to touch on are A, why emotional intelligence is important, and then B, um, can we do stuff to improve it, and if so, what is that? Um, so why is it important? I hope that in some of the stuff I just talked about, you can start to formulate your own ideas as to why you think it would be important. That's gonna be the most important part, again, is you formulating your own ideas about this. Um, but I think on the most basic level, there's a couple things of why I think EQ or emotional intelligence is so important. Ultimately, um, behavior is what drives this human experience. I believe I said that earlier. And we know that we are emotional creatures, right? Human beings, um, unlike most other species on this earth, have very high levels of emotion, and it's the gift and the curse of the human. Um, that being said, when those emotions become the drivers, if you will, of our behavior, we get ourselves in trouble, especially when we get to those emotional extremes, right? And that can be in anything. It's not just anger and fear and sadness. You can be, you know, high off joy and love and making really poor, bad decisions. Um, so, you know, we gotta look at this from the right perspective, but the reason that it's so important is because when we have control of our emotions, and we have control of how we interpret and accept other people's emotions, um, we can then have far better control of our behaviors, right? And then we can set behaviors and develop habits of behavior that are healthy, that are productive, that come from a growth mindset, right? Um, that come from a high level of emotional intelligence. Um, and that is why it is so important. When we can have high levels of emotional intelligence, we have the better ability to accept and control the emotional stimuli stimuli coming um, in and out of us, allowing for a more level, emotionally neutral playing field um, when we go to you know, have these behaviors, doing things that are positive, that will benefit, that will enhance our human experiment as opposed to doing things that are self-destructive and negative that can hurt ourselves um, or others. So that's why it is so dang important to work on your emotional intelligence because we can't let our emotions and our egos drive the bus. That's where we get in trouble. Um, so what do we do to kind of, you know, see um, how, you know, how do we get better at this? The good thing is it can be, it can be learned. While there is a genetic component, um, most researchers believe, it's been widely proven now that your behaviors um, directly influence everything in your life on a number of levels. And we're gonna talk so much about behavior through this whole entire process and all of these principles. Um, but it is absolutely no different here. And so what do we need to do? Well, there's a few things that we can, we can do. Um, first, I wanna start, um, I wanna kinda of go back to a little bit more of the science. The EQ, the emotional intelligence, is actually, um, it stems and it's, it's like this pathway, right? From the um, limbic brain or the, uh, the, the emotional brain to, to the rational part of the brain. And it's literally a, a pathway. Um, it's physical, it's tangible. What happens as we have high 
levels of EQ, right? We have these uh, neurons that kind of come and grow out and they grow to this pathway and they're able to really communicate between the emotional brain and the rational brain really, really well. So we have these two centers of our brain and we have a wide open pathway with lots of neuro connection, lots of information traveling back and forth. This tissue is actually malleable, right? It, it changes and um, it gets healthier with more repetition of good behaviors, of good things that promote um, high levels of emotional intelligence. So um, what we have to do ultimately is train the brain um, on this guy. Some ways, the best ways that we can do that. First and foremost, I say look back at the four things that we just talked about, the four components, and identify an area of struggle. Um, once you identify the area of struggle, try to identify a behavior or two in that area of struggle, okay? Um, as we're kind of working through life, our goal is we want to break these old unhealthy behavioral habits and then develop new ones to put into their place. Um, so in a real life application, what does that look like? That's catching yourself in a behavior, right? It's stopping for a moment. It's taking a deep breath to try to relax or something like that, try to focus, and then to insert a new behavior on top of that. Um, a way that we can kind of, uh, an example of this is our typical morning commute, right? We're driving down the highway, someone's in a hurry, cuts us off, we have to swerve, next thing you know, we're screaming, F you, throwing up fingers, that kind of thing. The road rage, right? We've all probably experienced that to some degree or another. Well, we've also probably seen stories of how that road rage has led to people being shot, right? Getting killed, getting in fights, all kinds of really bad stuff, all because a guy, right, um, cut you off. So instead of that, what, what would we do? Right, the guy cuts you off. We realize, hey, screw you. Let's catch that. I've, oh, I'm angry right now, right? I've caught that. Maybe I shouldn't be yelling screw you at this. Take a breath. Okay, I'm realizing I'm angry, I'm identifying it, right? I'm self-aware, now I'm self-regulating. Okay, I'm self-regulating this. Hey, you know what, maybe the guy or the girl in that car is um, late for work and you know they're gonna get fired if they don't get there. So now I'm empathizing, right? I'm, I'm empathizing, you know what, they have a situation they're going through and um, you know what, I can, that's okay with that. And then finally, you know what, I'm gonna prick that into something social and redirect that energy into something new, something awesome. Listening to your favorite song, um, turning into the latest LifeCast video, um, talking to, you know, giving a call to someone on the phone, any, any, anything like that that can redivert this negative hostility that you've identified, you're working to stop it, and then you can replace it with something positive where the physiology in the brain starts to kick up happiness. And again, as we do this, we start to rearrange this thing physically, physiologically, it's changing. Um, and then those incidents become less and less um, frequent and it's a lot easier to kind of stop them. So, you know, long story short is identify that behavior if you can, you gotta catch yourself there. Um, you can also, you know, give people permission to, hey, if they catch you, if you have a good relationship, you can kind of coach each other. Um, but anyways, catch the behavior. Take a breath, you know, empathize with that person and then find something new to kind of uh, switch your attention to something positive. That's a really, really good way. And as you do this, it becomes second nature. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really good um, thing that we can do to try to help us. Um, let's see here. Another couple things is reducing stress. Stress in our life is a huge cause of emotional hardship. So reduce stress. Um, stress is very interesting. The right amount and the right kind of stress actually has a ton of great benefits. Use stress. Um, the benefits of these are like if you're under a deadline but it may you know, inc um, increase motivation, better memory, um, certain things like that. Certain use stresses are very good for us. However, that's a very fine line and we tend to jump way over that line um, when we get into this point of distress and excess distress, right? We are just constantly in this state of Oh my God, this, that, and the other. What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, screw the guy who, um, you know, who, uh, who cut me off, those kind of things. Trying to reduce that level of, of distress can really, really help um, identify those emotions when they come on and help us get control of them. So a few things that we can do um, to, um, uh, you know, reduce that stress, exercise, um, good nutrition, 
breathing or meditation or prayer, any of those things that, um, that you like. Um, laughing more, having fun, being around people um, that we like to be around. Those are all really good things that we have a lot of control over that will ultimately help reduce our stress levels, which will um, have massive benefits that we'll talk about stress a ton throughout this whole entire process, but reducing stress. Um, and then uh, a last little thing, um, improve your sleep. Improving your sleep um, has, believe, believe it or not, sleep has a huge effect on emotions. I'm sure that we've all been there when you haven't slept and just everything sets you off for no reason and it's just because you haven't slept, right? So what, one of the interesting things about the human brain is that throughout our normal processes of the day, um, there's byproducts of chemicals that get kind of stuck in the brain and that's a 100% normal, natural thing. Part of the sleep um, process clears those chemicals out of the brain, right? And flushes them and lets the brain kind of start anew. When we don't get enough sleep or don't get through our sleep cycles, our body and our brains have a hard time flushing those toxins and that's when we get groggy and we get become very emotional and things like that. Um, so what are a few things that we can do um, to improve our, I, I say improve our sleep hygiene. Um, and first and foremost is develop a consistent sleep schedule. Um, you know, you hear different things, six, seven, eight hours of sleep, it's gonna be different for every person. Um, but find those, make sure you're getting those hours that are good for your body to get the rest it needs to um, be able to clear the toxins and kind of recharge and reset the battery. Um, so get that constant sleep schedule. Wake up and go to bed at the same time as much as possible every day. It's gonna help set the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is kind of the, the easy way to look at it. It's like that natural process of, you know, um, how our day is going to go, waking up, the energy flows till we go to bed and the different biochemicals and the different hormones and all the things that kind of go on in the physiological processes of the body. Very important. That kind of segues the circadian rhythm. We do a lot of things that kind of break up that circadian rhythm and get it screwy. Um, one of the biggest things we do is use sleep aids, right? Benadryl, um, uh, melatonin, Ambien, all of these things. And we say, oh yeah, we take these so I can get some sleep. Well, truly we're confusing sedation with sleep, right? Sedation and sleep are two separate things. When you're sedated, you actually aren't going through your full sleep cycles. We don't get our full REM sleep often. And um, that's why we wake up ultimately still so groggy after you've taken a sleeping aid and you might have slept 10 hours but you're still so groggy and it's because you actually never went through all your sleep cycles and the body could not properly um, get rid of the chemicals, right? And, and, and reset like it should. So that therefore um, imperative, let's cut out those sleep aids as, as much and as quickly as we can because they're only sedating us and they're not giving us true rest and true sleep. Um, so um, that's that. And then another thing is we live on a ton of caffeine and other stimulants. An interesting thing about caffeine, I'm a caffeine drinker myself. Um, we often wake up in the morning and have our caffeine and then again, we have that like two or three o'clock dose of an energy drink or a coffee or a soda. But we don't realize caffeine has a six hour half-life. So that means by eight or nine o'clock, right? Depending on when you drink that, still half of that caffeine is in your system doing its thing, right? Um, causing um, you know nervous system stimulation, increased heart rate, um, heart rate vasoconstriction, all these things that caffeine does in the body. So we drink that three o'clock, you know, coffee or whatever, bust out the last few hours of the work day, maybe go work out, do our, our adult thing that we need to do after work and it's time for bed, but we still have all this caffeine in our body. So we're very stimulated. So we need to kind of try to cut that out um, as much as possible. And I'm not stopping drinking caffeine, but I'm gonna, I try to hold it to um, none after noon or one o'clock. Um, you know, that early afternoon, that way it doesn't really affect me when I go to bed. And then the, kind of the last thing that we can do to help with our sleep hygiene is reduce um, the amount of blue light that we take in. Um, so blue light is really interesting. It's a natural thing. It comes from the sun. In fact, the light early in the morning in the first part of the day, it's filled with blue light. And what blue light does um, physiologically in us, it helps um, kind of wake up all the chemicals and things that, um, that we need to get up and have energy to go about our day. And it helps suppress um, the things that would you know, like, you know, put us to sleep, say like a melatonin or some of these other chemicals. And so what's interesting is this same blue light is the same stuff that's coming right off our computer screens, our phone screens, our TVs, all that, right? Our Kindles, it's just emitting this blue light. 
And often, myself, I know, I'm sitting there either watching TV or I'm checking my phone or I'm even reading my Kindle and just blue light hitting me, hitting me, hitting me and it has the same effect, right? It is suppressing the melatonin and the other chemicals that are supposed to come out to help me get sleepy and rest and then it is enhancing um, uh, my want to be awake. It's stimulating my nervous system, right? And some of those um, uh, chemicals, uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, some of these other chemicals that are associated with more active states. Um, and so that right there, you know, sending mixed signals to the body and you have a hard trouble, hard time sleeping. Um, all right, I'm going, it's been a long, it's been a long, long live. I appreciate it. A um, couple things here. I obviously am by no means an expert on any of this. Um, I have read and researched and implemented some techniques from the best people, the best educators the, in the world. And I've, and I've picked the things that I think are awesome and I've kind of made my own little recipe and developed these principles. And what I hope you do through all these videos is take the things that you love, the things that really hit home with you, put those in your recipe, right? Make your principles. Um, because that's how this has to work. If these principles I give you, if you follow them as a list of rules, it won't work. Find the gems that you love. What's the things that really, really um, resonated with you? Start working on those. Start developing your own set of principles. Um, I really, really appreciate everyone who tuned in. I really had a lot of fun. I was nervous. It kind of went a little long. I don't know what I'm doing, but I hope you found it beneficial. I hope I was able to... Um, uh, kind of, you know, educate you and ultimately start to empower you to empower yourself. Um, if you liked this, please keep checking back. Go to the um, LifeCast Facebook, LifeCast YouTube, um, Twitter, Instagram. I'm going to put all those links on, in the description when I actually post this. Um, go join all of those. Become because we're going to put content on all of those platforms exclusive to each of those. So you might, if you only have me on Facebook, you might not um, get the Instagram that's coming, right? Or if you're only on Instagram and Facebook, but not on the YouTube, you're definitely going to miss out on a lot of stuff. So go do that. The last thing and the most important thing with all this, again, it's your participation, not only liking and joining all these channels, comment, have discussions, but talk to the people who weren't here. Talk to the people at work, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends. You can tell them about me and tell them about LifeCast. That's all good. I'd love that. But tell them about the principles. Educate them. Help empower them to empower themselves and teach them then how they can empower others or help empower others. Because that's what this is. We need to work as a community. We need to know each other and love each other and embrace each other. We need to educate and empower each other. Um, and that is my 100% goal is to make this a community of people doing things the right way, living their best lives. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will be again, um, I will be back again next Monday unveiling the second of the principles of the three flames. I really hope you're there to tune into that and stay tuned this week because there will be um, some great content talking more about emotional intelligence, um, what that means, how we can apply that coming this week. Um, on all the various platforms. Uh, last but not least, you can email me, Lennon at lifecastonline.com. If you have any questions, um, that kind of thing, I'd love to hear um, if you pulled any of these principles and tried to work on them um, today, or, or excuse me, in your daily lives and how that worked. Please share your stories. All right, much love. Uh, I'm out, I'm hungry. Ah! I love you guys, peace out, enjoy life.